Hey guys, we got a great show for you today. R&B Reptiles here out in Philadelphia, hanging out with our friend Joe. He's from Port City Pythons, and we're gonna show you around his collection. He has a bunch of really cool stuff, a bunch of glubrids, and you guys are gonna love this, so stay tuned. So what do you got there? So this is a green tree python named Limeade and he is actually a Jayapura locality mixed with a sarong locality. So a lot of times you see these guys imported from Indonesia and this guy is actually US captain born and bred which I think really makes a difference when it comes to handling as far as like oh, yeah. I can take this guy out and handle him whenever I want to when most are commonly a bit oh, more yeah. defensive than that. That's awesome. That's a really cool name. I like that name. Comment below if you guys think that's a really great name. Limeade. So this here is a blue-eyed leucistic western rat snake or otherwise known as a Texas rat snake in the hobby, which was actually the, tax yeah, the taxonomy was changed. As you can see, she's kind of like flopping around and flipping around her tail because she's definitely trying to musk me. But she's acting really, really good. Very well. Yeah. This is about as good as a... Uh, Western rat snakes ever gonna behave? They're, I mean, notoriously uh, defensive. Mm -hmm. But she, I actually had her out a little bit earlier, so maybe that's why. She's super pretty. Yeah, I mean, there's really nothing better than like a white snake with blue eyes, right? Yeah. I know that like, we've grown used to it because we have, you know, you see ball pythons with, and all other types of leucistic snakes, but yeah, you see that? <laughs> she gave me a good defense. I wish she would just hold it like that. That'd be pretty cool. <laughs> she opened her mouth like ah. Oh, yeah, <laughs> I suppose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there That's it is. Awesome. Blue eyed leucistic rat snake. All right, so this here is a Slowinski's rat snake or Pantherophis slowinskii. This is actually named after herpetologist Joseph Slowinski. Joseph Slowinski was in Myanmar actually, September eleventh, two thousand one. Oh. He got bit by a crate, and oh. uh, by one of his research assistants, who was like a local guide. And uh, he told them it was a lycodon or a dynodon, a kind of a wolf snake, a colubrid that's non-venomous, a mimic of the crate, but it was an actual crate. And uh, he got bit and venomated. They couldn't fly him out because it was September 11th and he died in Myanmar. And wow. uh, this snake was actually, is actually the newest known North American rat snake in existence and therefore in the late 90s or just kidding, it was the early 2000s, <laughs> uh, it was named after Joseph Slowinski because he was... Uh, he really loved the ecology of Louisiana, and this snake is actually from the Louisiana and Texas border. That's awesome. So it has a really small range, like yeah. right on the border, like Kasachi is kind of a really known national forest for colubrid folks, because there's quite a few snakes that, that are there, and they range on, a lot of people call them Kasachi corn snakes. Okay. Or Kasachi rat snakes, mm -hmm. which kind of drives me crazy. <laughs> because that's just one national forest on the Texas-Louisiana border. They exist outside of that. They even exist in one pocket in Arkansas. Yeah. I don't know if anyone that's ever seen one or has one, but... But, uh, yeah, no, it, it's a cool-looking snake, but it's really cool that, you, you know, you find something that's rare that's... Um, has for me, it's like a story behind it. Yeah, it's a good story, for sure. Yeah, and these were actually thought to be corn snakes that just integrated with emery rat snakes, so... And that really makes yeah. sense to where they are in the country. They're really on the edge of those two ranges. But once DNA research, once we were able to, not me obviously, but once people, once they were able to sequence the genome, they realized that they're actually two different animals. Gotcha. Yeah, it's a little brown and uh, gray snake. So, so these guys actually have two morphs. One of them is an anery, and the other one is silver leaf, which silver leaf is like a pattern mutation. Well, no, I mean, there's no <laughs> other silver leaf, so you, yeah. there's no way you would know, but yeah, so they have an anery and a silver leaf, that, uh, which is just a pattern mutation that is kind of like tessera in corn snakes, and I'll show you plenty of tesseras, I'm sure. Uh, really cool that's, snake. Yeah, man, that's a great story. Yes, so this is my male Louisiana pine snake, or Pituophis ruthveni. And this is a federally listed endangered species. So these can't go across state lines. And mm -hmm. at the moment, I mean, it seems like everyone who's breeding them is kind of in uh, 
is in Pennsylvania, which is kind of weird. But uh, yeah, we're all kind of working with, this is Bandy Venterline, and these were acquired in the, I believe it was either the early 90s or late 80s. Basically, Van Eventer, and then there was also a guy named Theron Majors who basically just put a sign out in Bienville Parish in Louisiana and said, hey, I want this snake. Can you find it for me? And people just brought them stock to breed. So that's how we got the initial animals. Obviously, before we had enough research to realize how endangered they were. Mm -hmm. So at the time, they were unlisted, and then actually they just became federally endangered in 2018. So Oh, wow. Yeah, so it was rather recent, and uh, but it's still a really cool snake to have, even though there's no economic incentive behind them, really. Yeah, do you, so are you successfully breeding them? Yeah, so these guys I actually bred myself. Um, so this male and the female that I had out earlier. So they actually have an epiglottis that goes in the back, which acts as a vocal cord. And my adults, you can actually hear them from the other room. So I can be downstairs, and from upstairs with the door closed, I can hear the adults hissing like this. So That's so funny. We're two babies out of only three eggs. So the Louisiana oh. pine snake, part of why it's so endangered is the fact that it only lays up to eight eggs. And eight is a large clutch. Eight is when people say it's probably a hybrid with a bull snake. Okay. Now, I don't believe that because there are lines, um, particularly that Theron Majors line seems to throw eight eggs or so um but people like to throw that blanket statement oh if it had if it had six or more eggs it's probably a hybrid but that's not really uh so that's really no cool though that it. it's cool that you're you're breeding them in something that's federally endangered so that's another way that you know through uh captivity that we do conservation and uh it's really awesome that you're working with them yeah so this is actually the rarest snake in north america so this is actually the most endangered snake we have in the united states wow i did not know that there you go, here's one. <laughs> and they have really cool keeled scales, so. So in their natural habitat, they'll all actually take over gopher holes, so they'll just go down the hole, mm. they'll go down and, they don't constrict, they're not a, in captivity they'll constrict, but in the burrow, they'll actually grab one of them and then smash all the others on the side of the, uh, of the burrow mm -hmm. and kind of crush them alive. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> I mean, it makes sense. It's you know, the way they do it. It's pretty gnarly, but uh, those keeled scales really allow them to pin animals against the wall and to get their meals. And they actually hatch out like, they hatch out like a ball python. So a lot of colubrids, like a lot of the other ones I'm going to show you guys today, hatch out very small, probably, you know, eight inches or so. These guys hatch out e eating adult mice, which is Whoa. both convenient and both <laughs> awesome. And the, the eggs are actually, we laid it next to a dollar bill mm -hmm. and the eggs are really oblong and they're about as long as a dollar bill. As long as a dollar bill? <laughs> yeah. That's insane. And yeah. is how, so how big do they get? Is this, I mean, this is a pine snake, so they're like a six footer, or is this like close? So the, the Louisianas, for whatever reason, bull snakes, pine snakes seem to get bigger as they go up. So like there's the, the Jersey pines, they call them like Jersey giants. Mm -hmm. And they're huge, man. They can be like eight feet easy. The yeah. Louisiana pines are actually one of the smaller species um, in Pituophis, so they only get about five feet. Okay. Yeah, they're Very super manageable. manageable. Yeah. I don't know how they start off so large, and mm. they start off larger than other Pituophis, but don't get bigger. Oh. I don't know. And they also they also take four years to get to maturity, so it's like, it's not one of those ones that you, you grow up and you can get in two to three years. It, it's a solid four years. Gotcha. That's really cool that you're working with them. Like I Makes said, sense. I would talk too much. No, no, that's great. This is all great information. Uh, this is a gray rat snake, or probably more technically or more correctly known as the Midland rat. So if people don't know, there are three, you know, rat snakes in the United States as far as the common species. I mean, corn snakes are a rat snake, the Slowinski has a rat snake, but I'm talking there's a Western, there's a Midland, and there's an Eastern. So it used to be, it used to be that the Eastern was the black phase or the black rat snake. Mm -hmm. But now we realize that it actually is more by geography rather than phenotypes or the look of the animal. It's more about uh, where the animal's located and less about what the animal looks like. Okay. So you can have a snake that's black and a snake that's yellow and it's the same exact species. 
It used to be that they were broken up into subspecies. You know, there's Everglade rat snakes, there was the yellow rat snake, there was the black rat snake. Now they're all just eastern rat snakes. So, oh. just to make it confusing for everyone. That, this is a black eastern rat snake. <laughs> and the black rat snake starts off looking like this, yeah. like this gray rat snake. Well, we are from Jersey and we get them all the time. It's like the most common snake that when people say, hey, what is this snake? It's in my yard. It's almost always a black eastern rat snake. I'll start saying that. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, just call them black More, rat snakes. Or, yeah, and you'll hear people call them black snakes or down south, like the western rats are called chicken snakes or yeah. coop snakes or chicken coop snakes because yeah. they're always stealing people's eggs or trying to eat people's chickens. And There's yeah. plenty of videos of people having like a, like a two-foot colubrid or a two-foot rat snake trying to eat a full-grown chicken. <laughs> Obviously it doesn't work, but yeah. but they'll try to take down pretty much whatever <laughs> they can. But this here is just a baby. They'll get about six feet or so. Yeah, yeah. That's awesome. So this here is an eastern rat snake, what most people would call an Everglades rat snake. So in the Everglades, for whatever reason, the eastern rat snakes are a much redder coloration. Outside of the Everglades in that area, they're more of a yellow coloration. And then obviously up north here, they're black. But this guy actually starts off pretty gray, maybe a little bit of yellow and red and orange in him. This is a yearling. Mm -hmm. And as you can see, gaining a lot of that orange. And yeah. hopefully as an adult, this will be a patternless red animal. So they actually lose all of that pattern. You know, it's an optogenetic color change, much like people see in like green tree pythons or something like yeah. that. That's cool. And that thing is musking really good. You smell it, I just it, can't right? smell on that. <laughs> we don't have smell a vision, but. Yeah, rat snake, you're pretty much guaranteed a musk or a bite. You're lucky if you don't get both, you know? Yeah, yeah. But I can, I can settle for this. Yeah. Not bad. Not so bad, yeah. It's pungent. It's a little rough. <laughs> <laughs> So this here is a, what we call goini, which is a common king snake, Lampropeltis gatula goini. And they are native to the Florida panhandle. And these have actually been split up since. There's means eye and there's goini. I think means eye is probably the more correct term. I'm not sure exactly how it works to be honest, but this is a striped individual. They're usually called, and you've probably maybe seen them called goini or um, they're super variable, so I forget what else the other name is, but uh, editing, I guess. <laughs> You're fine. But these are guys that actually fade out with age, so a lot of the rat snakes get more saturated with age. You know, like that gray rat snake starts off, that's a bad example, so that Everglades <laughs> rat snake starts off gray and then turns red, but this guy actually turns, or starts off like deep red or bright orange and then kind of fades out, out to a yellow. Yeah, we a lot of ball pythons, you know, kind of do similar things like that. They start off as babies, they look awesome, and then as adults, they're like, yeah, you know, like they're getting that. There's a handful of genes that we try to work with that, you know, kind of the big idea is to try to get snakes that look as good as babies as they do adults. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's things that you start working with that we like, and you know, we're learning more and more about every day, and uh, so we understand that and. You know that happens but it doesn't mean you don't love the animal just as much it's still a super cool animal like the you know variability of where you're getting them from mm -hmm. and you know versus diversifying the collection and stuff so i think i think what's good about these like a species like this is that whoever's buying this mm -hmm. pretty much knows you yeah, know yeah. they know what's going on if you want a going eye you probably you're probably out there looking for a going eye you don't really just stumble upon them so mm -hmm. it's like so i don't have to deal with you know, having to explain that to someone and someone be disappointed at it. Sure. Or buy it once it grows up, but... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, cool little animal. Crazy little thing. He's cool now, though, right? Yeah, he's... Calm down. Oh, <laughs> uh, great. So here is a little baby Mexican black kink snake. This, this was actually produced by my friend Colin at Crosstown Exotics. And uh, I do have an adult pair downstairs brewmating, so hopefully we will produce some Mexican black kink snakes this year. It's like the most in-demand king snake right now. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't 100% get it because it wasn't always that way, but I'm glad it is that way because it's an awesome snake and I'm glad yeah. people are appreciating it. No, they're, they're really cool. I think just because they're jet black, you know, people really like, you know, all white snakes or jet black snakes or, 
you know, high white pods, always going to be in demand. You and know, Jet so. Black's the only thing that the ball python guys haven't made yet, so. No, we, there's some ball pythons that are Jet Black. Mm -hmm. That look they're, like ducks. They're, 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 they're not, not as dark, but they're real close. <laughs> not that black. Not this black. No. This is like full melanistic, like everything, but it's close. We have some, but these are really cool animals. Nothing and, better than the old, old natural black, you know? That's true. <laughs> no morphs needed. Yeah. That's cool. So what is the, uh, before you put them away, what's the care like on these guys? So if people want to get out there, you know, I mean, you're saying this is high demand. We know that they are too. Whenever we go to a show, they're the ones that sell out like every time. But, um, and the price of them has just skyrocketed in the last like four years. Yeah. But, uh, so what's the care like? So the members? care is super simple and honestly, the care is very similar, if not identical, for all of these North American colubrids, and that's 85 degree hot spot, you know, your normal water bowl hide. I prefer substrate just because I like to, especially for an animal like this that is going to burrow. So mm -hmm. when I put three inches of substrate in the enclosure, even if I have a hide in there, a lot of times I find these guys all the way on the bottom of the yeah. enclosure. Like for whatever reason, they just like to be under as much thing, as many things as possible. Mm -hmm. So I try to give them that. What kind of substrate do you use? So I use aspen bedding usually, but there's yeah. really nothing, there's nothing against using like cocoa or any of the other substrates as long as it's not, you know, aromatic, like, mm -hmm. and I, I even know people who keep on pine, but. Yeah, well you can use baked pine, you know, but. You just, I mean, I don't tell people that. It's just, tr it's tough to make sure that it's baked, you know? <laughs> yeah, you just want to be safe and know Right, it. so it's better just to, to, you know, not do it unless you're sure, so. I get it. Yeah. So then what do they eat? Yeah, Aside so from other snakes. <laughs> well, yeah, that is true. It's always nice as a breeder to have king snakes around. Yeah, yeah. They will dispatch whatever goes wrong as far as stillborns and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So you get to diversify their diet. I think that's somewhat important as far as mm -hmm. I have a bunch of king snakes. They are natural snake eaters. Mm -hmm. And we're not talking about every once in a while. We're talking about a majority of their diet is typically, you know, yeah. other snakes. So I think it's important to at least get it in there. They do great on rodents, don't get me wrong, mm -hmm. but it's nice to supplement every once in a while. I even, I even fed my adult Mexican black king snake a, an infertile corn snake egg, so. Okay, sure. And they ate it with no problem. Do you ever do like quail eggs or, um, I don't know, other like chicken or chicks? I know chicks might be a little big for some of them, but. Yeah, I think, I think poultry is usually a good way to go as far mm -hmm. as if you're talking chicken or quail, especially for the rat snakes or, mm -hmm. you know, like the olive python, I'll throw him a, uh, or I'll throw her a quail or chick mm -hmm. every once in a while because these sure. animals are, especially the rat snakes are semi-arboreal, so yeah. they can eat birds more so than this guy would get yeah, to eat sure. birds. But king snakes will eat anything, mm -hmm. so you can kind of take advantage of that and yeah. uh, see, <laughs> see, what, <laughs> see if you can eat an infertile egg, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. We, uh, I have a, a lake near us and uh, one of my friends, he lives on it and um, he will see the black rat snakes or the eastern rat snakes fishing and they eat fish all the time out of the lake. It's like the coolest pictures he shows me, like snakes catching fish. You're like, oh, that's that cool. is why, like that's that is something that I wouldn't ever think yeah. of. Yeah, but they eat fish. They'll eat anything. Yeah. A lot of these guys are non-discriminatory yeah. in captivity, so I guess they are in the wild as well. Yeah. So these here are Eastern Black King Snakes. Okay. So we, we showed you the Mexican Black King Snake, and this is actually a King Snake that is native to the United States, and it's actually Lampropeltis nigra. So it's not the common King Snakes like uh, okay. Lampropeltis gatula, mm -hmm. but uh, it's actually a complete different species. And that baby, and you can see they start off with a lot more white, mm -hmm. and they slowly get darker with age. They'll never lose the Checker, checker pattern yep on the belly there it will always be black and white but the top will get almost completely black and uh, these guys I actually I hatched out that guy in uh, August mm -hmm. and this is a year old and that is just you know six months old or so but mm -hmm. all these babies I needed to start assist feeding mouse tails oh, yeah. and so it was actually about four or five months of feeding mouse tails until anyone wanted to take a pinky in they're not, they're actually not really known to be picky eaters. I just got to know exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And actually the same guy that sold me the pair, you know, he sold me the adult pair. He had bred before and his babies were eating and I tried all the things he did and nothing worked. And, uh, but now 
that randomly, uh, it was actually Christmas Eve, they all they all ate. They all ate a live pinky mouse. Merry Christmas. Merry, Merry Christmas. Christmas. <laughs> That's it, man. So I was really happy about that. Um, and they do get just about as big as a normal, uh, you know, maybe your cow king a little bit smaller than that. You know, mm. four feet, this animal's gonna be super tractable. I wish I had the adults out, but they're all in brumation. And uh, the adults are almost completely solid black. That's super cool. So kind of a alternative to the Mexican black king snake. Yeah, yeah. No, this one's the cool one. So this here is a Florida king snake. I mean, formerly known as a Brooks, another one of those things where colubrid taxonomy has been shifting a lot in mm. modern times, but a lot of the hobby still calls you know, a Brooks king snake. It still describes a high yellow Southern Florida, Florida king snake. Okay. So it just seems that the, the Florida king snakes that are more south mm -hmm. uh, tend to be more high yellow and were considered a subspecies Brooks eye, but now they're all Florida and they're the regular uh, Florida king snake. And this is actually head for three different things. So hypo lavender mosaic. Uh, I produced this guy this year. And uh, looking forward to getting visuals. It kind of, with colubrids, especially with what we're working with, a lot of it is recessive genes. So mm -hmm. you're talking about long-term projects. You don't really get that immediate satisfaction. Yeah, still, it's not a bad looking animal even, you know, as a normal looking, uh, I guess the morph, it's not a morph, you know, but. Yeah, it will, it's something that it will get more yellow with age. So the black will actually, all those little fleckings kind of in the saddle pattern. It mm -hmm. will expand over time and it will turn into like a like sprinkled, like peppered kind of look to it in okay. comparison to what it looks like now. It's less heavy patterned. Yep, so this here is a corn snake and this is actually produced by Larry Keller and he oh. just calls these orange. So... <laughs> it does look orange. I can't fault them there. Yeah, it's a pretty fair description. Um, I mean, they're definitely the amelanistic gene which is going to be albino. And, you know, obviously by those red eyes there and the lack of melanin all throughout the skin. And yeah, I mean, I don't have much else to say, but I can't wait to produce this. I actually have a baby orange and mm -hmm. uh, I'm just pumped to see what it is. And I'll probably try to take the ingredients and see what they actually are and kind of try to prove out what's in it. Yeah. Um, so that'll be a little bit of an adventure, but I think it's a really cool looking animal. It gets super bright orange with age. That's awesome. Look cool and generally corn snakes are pretty easy to manage, they're easy to keep, um, you know, eat rodents well. So corn snakes are typically, you know, the best starting pet. They're the easiest to keep, you really can't mess them up um, mm -hmm. and they eat rodents readily. So yeah. right off right off the bat, they're usually pretty tractable, I mean this one's pretty calm but he does want to eat me occasionally. But for the most part, once they get to adulthood, I mean they're so solid as far oh, yeah. as handling and as far as eating. and everything like that and I kind of want to uh, pull out an adult just to just to get a size yeah. yeah so that there is an annery and that's actually a retired breeder so that is not only adult size but it's a pretty old girl right there mm -hmm. and uh, yeah I mean it's a super manageable snake I mean maybe four to five feet um, right but super thin compared to like a lot of our viewers are ball python people so colubrids like this, they don't get very thick, so they're easy to manage, but they can get pretty long, um, but clearly not retake long or anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's something that can be kept, I mean, pretty much in the same quarters as a ball python would. Oh yeah. Yeah, so it's not anything uh, out of the ordinary as far as your first pet snake, I mean, you're looking at. Oh yeah. The only, the only thing about ball pythons is the humidity and the feeding and stuff like that, and I think corn snakes really solve that. Yeah, I think when people ask me, you know, what's the best the best snake to get, you know, as your first pet is either a corn snake or a ball python. You know, I think both of them are very manageable. Um, but I guess I should include the fact that they start off so small and people are super intimidated by how flighty and small they are and they're scared yeah. they're going to lose them and people often lose them. So I would say that these are the best snakes to keep for the snake itself because it does well and it thrives in captivity so easily mm -hmm. yeah but to get over that first year when they're super small maybe not the best for like a little kid to hold right 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 yeah they can jump out of your hands kind of quick yeah um, and then they're gone in an instant right yeah but 
Usually some of ours, like, when they get going, they, like, just, like, and, like, the, the front half of their body goes like that. And you're, like, what? You're going to break in half. I don't know what you're doing right now. Yeah, I just hate when they don't hold on to you and they just decide they go crazy. Yeah, yeah. Because, like, that one's just, he's not holding on. He's not really anchoring with his tail that well. Right. He's just kind of being weird. Uh, That's cool. So these are all honeys, which is caramel sun kiss. This is the normal honey, and this is the honey tessera. And that there is a honey that's a year old. Honey, huh? It's really nice looking. They like how creamy they look. Yeah, and they look they look yellow and black as adults. So they'll start off like a almost caramel type color, maybe like a a dark honey, and then they get over to being a bright yellow animal. And I'm breeding these currently. I'm trying to put more black in there because I want that like Contrast. I want it like a bee. You know, I yeah, want yeah, it yeah. to have thick black borders and be super yellow. So. That's why I held that guy back. I held this guy back. Um, they aren't the most yellow, but they have the best border pattern, and that's kind of what I'm going for. But uh, this yeah. is probably one of our more popular projects. So. That's awesome. That's you know something that we tell people all the time. Don't always go by you know what the trends are doing or whatever. Just go by something that you're passionate about and uh, sticking with something like contrast and really going after it, so that you are producing something that you enjoy. And that way, in a couple of years, when you're like, man, this stinks that I'm not getting any babies yet, or I don't have exactly what I want, you know, you still have the love for the animal, and uh, you can still keep that passion, and it makes a big difference. And know? I think it's nice because the corn snake market is so mature that everything is pretty much under $200. Yeah. So, you know, everything's affordable, but also you can get pretty much any animal to that level if you line breed it enough. So there's some, you know, line bred animals that look completely different from the like just simple mutation. You know, people have been breeding these now since Bechtel proved out the albino, I mean, in the early or late 50s or so, I think is when they first found them. He may have bred them in the 60s, but this is really what started morphs as far as the ML corn snake was the first mutation of any snake to be captive bred. I mean, it started this whole mutation craze. Mm -hmm. And people don't know that like corn snakes went through the whole iteration very early. So right now you're seeing it at the end and people are like corn snakes are kind of a throwaway kind of pet. And mm -hmm. I don't really believe that because first of all, they're so interactive and they're easy to keep, and easy to keep, affordable, accessible. There's a lot around. Uh, I, I don't think that's a bad market. I think a lot of times uh, most animal markets go through a cyclical you know, stage and we've been, you know, doing this for about nine years. We're not like, you know, old heads that we've been doing this for 20, 30 years, but uh, we just, just from what we've seen and what we hear in the stories, there's a lot of cycles of things. I mean, berms are coming back now. Like it seems like people are now starting to get back into berms. People and, would love if you had an Indian rock python yeah. or, or an African rock African python rocks, yeah. and uh, the Indian python, same genus, but different snake. and. Those are snakes that are like, oh man, that's snakes that I don't know why people want to keep them, but they're cool now. And that, yeah. or things like Sanzinia, the Madagascar uh, tree boa, mm -hmm. they're getting super popular. And you just see kind of these trends within rare snakes, within even mutations. I mean, yeah. now everything has clown and pied in it and ball pythons. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's like, true. <laughs> when, <laughs> not everything, everything. When I, uh, everything's at least het clown or het pied. Yeah. <laughs> so, and, and when I was, you know, when I started, it was, you get a pastel, you get a spider, and you want to make those damn bumblebees, right? Yeah, that's or everybody you, wants a bumblebee. Or you just put pastel in everything. That yeah. was a thing. And it was all in complete dominance because no one wanted to take the time to do recessives. Yeah. And now that it's matured, those recesses have held a lot better than the incomplete dominance, which I think is just interesting. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And like, uh, we do the skinks, and we were talking about that earlier, we do the blue tongue skinks, and like 10 years ago, they're like, you know, 60 bucks on the table, everybody has them, you know, it's not a big deal. Now they're, you know, kind of a sought after animal, and it's, they're easy to keep, and they're fun, and people are really starting to figure them out, and it's a, it's a fun market to be in. Um, but I think that things come around, you know, so I don't think that, Corn snakes have like really done. Yeah, back. I think it's. Yeah. I think it's just a, a good animal. And once the pet market really picks up with them, um, it's really pet market really controls mm -hmm. the market. But people don't in our hobby don't ever see that. No, they're like, no, it's only the hobby people. You know, you gotta you gotta market just to the guys that are gonna buy these ten thousand dollar ball pythons. But really, 
the pet market that's going to buy the three hundred dollar bot three hundred dollar ball python. That's where the money's at for sure. Mm -hmm. Like no question. So it's if like, you could just if you could just produce ten thousand pies, you oh, probably yeah. be, be better off than trying to trace all these different projects. Yeah. If you really, when it comes down to it, a lot of the people who have known have long term success in snakes. Mm -hmm. First of all, have numbers. Yeah. Um, it's not. I think a lot of times the mentality in ball pythons is get a rack get 10 of the most expensive snakes you can bring them together and then bam you're good to go yeah no the good people do a lot of marketing they do a lot of branding i mean their animals mean something i mean even even take these honeys for example if someone got a honey put them together and went to go sell them i'm still going to be able to get more money for my honeys because it's our line it's the port city pythons honeys that people want it's our brand it's our snakes and like right that sounds douchey when I used myself as an example. <laughs> I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> I meant to use something else as an example, but like, you know, if Justin Kabelka has a clown, it's worth much more in his hands than anyone else's. Yeah, it's And exactly. people need to realize that it's kind of building your name and that takes time. And right. here we have Anri Hypo Corn Snakes, otherwise known as Ghosts. And we work with a few different looks of ghosts, I want to call it. And this is a coral ghost. And as you can see, it will get more pink coloration. Um, typically, the normal ghost would be more of a slate gray type of look to it. But And this is from one of our dark anery females, so I'm really excited about that one. And that is what I'm calling our icy ghost, which is oh. something I just made up. And wow. uh, yeah, I just thought it because it was just such a like nice, lighter coloration mm -hmm. um, and just looks a little bit different than the other ones that I saw. Yeah, it definitely and looks frosted. It's just it's just the way that I refer to it. I mean, it's not like it's an actual thing. No, no, I just put thing like I a, just put like on icy on <laughs> like like sometimes on the top of containers I'll put some type of characteristic yeah, yeah. that I see and that one was icy. So Well, it's in it's in YouTube world now. These are ICs. It's, it's canon. Yeah, that's it. That's it, man. <laughs> Yeah, because I'll be like, why did I hold that back? I want to know what exactly I saw in that animal at that particular time. Because I may have forgotten, like, yeah. it's like, no, I like the way that that looks for this reason. So it's nice to have that. And then this is, uh, this is a baby that was hatched out this summer. And that's an animal that I hatched out about a year and a half ago. So that's kind of the size difference that can, that can happen in just a about year. About a year, yeah. And it really goes from being a super small kind of if this was a flighty animal i mean it wouldn't be a great animal to hold to an animal that's a lot more manageable yeah yeah we we find that with a bunch of our colubrids you know like once they get to the size where they can actually eat meals that are a lot more nutritional um some of the larger meals they shoot up real fast so it's like small for a long time and then all of a sudden they get big kind of quick and uh that's something cool about them yeah because like when you're feeding a snake like this, you're starting off with pinkies, and these are like, those are just basically bags of fluid, right? Yeah. And then once you, you want to get all that good bones and fur in there and stuff, and once you get up to like hopper mice, like that, that level, maybe a fuzzy mouse. Yeah. You're golden. Yeah, yeah They start exactly. taking off. And then even, I mean, you have snakes that, corn snakes that start off slow. So if I have a snake that won't eat for the first initial couple months, I can have snakes from the same year that are one's twice as big as the other. Yeah. I mean, they just they just grow so much if they eat well. And uh, so it's really important. I think people maybe overlook now having a snake that's well started, a snake that is eating and mm -hmm. it's really huge for long-term health. I mean, if you're a breeder, you really want to make sure you're getting an animal that yeah, that really fed as soon as possible right off the bat at least with corn snakes. That's how I feel and I mean, I get to take first pick of all of them, so. <laughs> but that's a that's a perk. Yeah, yeah, and I'm trying to breed for animals that feed better. I mean, that's mm -hmm. just that's just the fact, and that I think will get us better animals down the road. And sure. I hope that people have good experiences. So we have uh, we have our friend Lori who had she bought two of our corn snakes, and she bought two other corn snakes, and then. The other two weren't started feeding. She had to get them going and do all that. And she had two of ours, same age, same everything. But I got them going. They had, you know, seven meals before I gave them to her. And those animals were eight grams and ours were 24 grams. Yeah. It's so it's like a huge difference. Yeah. So three times almost. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so it makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. So this here is an Ultramel Diffuse Mass Tessera. 
And so it is uh, the ultra gene, which is allelic with the amelanistic gene, which makes ultramel. And then mask is an incomplete dominant in corn snakes and diffuses the recessive gene. And tessera is a dominant. Some people call it dominant. Some people call it incomplete dominant. Some people say there's a super form. I haven't proved it out. So uh, I don't know. I guess that's still up in the air. But as you can see, they have like, starts off with this bald head and it's almost like a bluish color, especially when it comes out of the egg. And then that will kind of fade into a red. This whole animal will become red. One of the coolest things is the belly pattern. So the sides are completely wiped out. That's the diffused morph or mutation. And the belly here is just like random whites. And it's really, once it gets a little bit older, it will be like a very bright orange and white. And it makes a super, super cool animal. And this is actually something that as far as I know, we've only produced these, so this is a this isn't a world's first because I have an animal that's already growing up that's in brumation that is actually has the same genes in it, and I've produced one other one, and I sold it last year, and then this is going to our friend Amanda. Okay. So yeah, so it's a pretty unique corn snake. Uh, it's real cool. Hashtag world's first. Yeah. Is that a thing? Still. It is now. Uh, it is now. <laughs> Some groups it is. Yeah. So this here is an Australian olive python mm -hmm. and they will get up to 12 to 15 feet so this is actually a small individual she's about three years old coming up on three years old it's an animal that I slow grow as far as I don't expect her to be full grown until about five or so okay but liasis and they're super uh, super attentive to their food and kind of when you open up the bin you gotta get out of the way and she's coming out but once you get her out she's really chill uh, one of my favorite things about liasis in general the whole genus which is um, you know like water pythons olive pythons is they do have like a glow to them as far mm -hmm. as the, the iridescence and yeah the uh, you can iridophores Awesome. Do you want me to hold her while you yeah. have another one? Yeah. That's a lot. So this is actually one of the only pythons. Uh, Liasis is one of the only genus of pythons that's actually patternless. So oh. if you notice, most pythons at least have a pattern, and uh, Liasis yeah, yeah. does not. Try and get in here. This is uh, actually this is my first time holding a, an olive python. I've seen them, you know, several times, but these guys are really cool. And we love Australian species of animals. Thinking what I'm thinking about. <laughs> I don't know if we have the, the room at the moment, but we do have that rack that you... Uh... I thought about getting a pair of head albinos. Yeah? I like the albino olives. <laughs> they're real cool. So that is, that is a thing about liasis is that they're not, they're not like majority snake eaters like king snakes are, but they, they will certainly it. will eat a snake. I mean, especially an olive. They've been known to eat their mates as far as captive breeding goes. They'll put them in together to breed, and then you'll find one olive python. <laughs> or, you know, worst comes to worst, honestly, if they're about the same size, the female will try to eat the male, and then she'll regurg and she'll die too. And, you know, you'll lose both animals in one wow. shot there. That's a bad situation. Yeah. I don't want that to happen. <laughs> yeah, so this is a water python, also in the genus Liasis, which. Also, like I said before, patternless, but I mean, the ear black coloration. Right. Yeah, the iridophores are just wild. Um, famously known for biting uh, Steve Irwin on the neck. You remember that video? I remember not that to not video. replicate it right now. <laughs> uh, the thing I love most about this, other than the iridophores and obviously the rainbow coloration that just goes off them, is just like, what color is that belly? Just like that crazy yellow belly. Mm -hmm. And it's, I don't know, I find it to be really Beautiful. attractive and She's a little crazy because it's nighttime, but olive or water pythons are typically very defensive, and that's because people are usually messing around with the Papua New Guinea imports mm -hmm. and kind of like the green tree pythons that we talked about before. Yeah. But the Australian olives, mm -hmm. I mean, they've been in the country for quite a while, or the Australian waters rather, and they seem to be a lot more docile. And this girl's just always been great, and she came from parents who were really great. And uh, I'm really happy with them. I mean, people don't, they're not a very highly desired animal, but it, it's, it's beautiful. beautiful. It's a, and these ones will also get like 12, 15? No, no, so this will only get about like six to eight feet at oh, the very that's most. Doable. Totally doable. Oh yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's just, you'll see with the babies are kind of a handful. Um, mm -hmm. You definitely don't get away with uh, without a bite kind of handling them as babies, but 
She's always been pretty good. Even the olive as a baby used to be a little bit of a biter and latch on and yeah, be hard to get her to let go. But what about um, feeding? Like, is it hard to get them feeding or? Oh yeah, to talk about care about all these. Yeah, yeah. For sure. So care for liasis or the water python and the olive python is pretty straightforward. Um, they're not animals that need super high humidity, but you know you want to keep it around fifty percent or you know even normal house humidity really isn't terrible for them. And then also, and you'll see they have kind of sensitive skin, so you'll still get dry patches if the humidity goes up. And I think that's kind of once you get into the rarer pythons or rarer colubrids, rare snakes in general, I think it's so important to watch your animals rather than read a care sheet. So mm -hmm. that's kind of something to where you're going to watch the behavior of the animal, you're going to watch the look of the animal in order to get the husbandry down. So if I see that the olive python has some dry spots in her scales and stuff like that, then I'll definitely bump up the humidity. But that is a rare occurrence and they eat readily on frozen thawed rodents. I mean, that is not even close to an issue. Yeah. Um, they just are crazy. They just, they launch out of tubs in order to, to take rodents down. Sounds like a great time. <laughs> and, and the typical python husbandry, I like to keep my pythons a little bit cooler. So these are at 88. Okay. You, know, you know, a lot of people make keep at 92 or something like that, but mm -hmm. I like to go a little bit cooler and I've never really had issues with it. Mm -hmm. I've even had ambient go down to probably 65 or so wow. and I haven't had issues with the, mm -hmm. like 85 degrees was probably the hot spot at the time and they haven't mm -hmm. had issues. Uh, I find the Australian pythons are just super hardy in general and yeah. it's kind of like, it kind of fits into my mode of keeping as far as eats frozen thawed, it doesn't have to be super hot. Mm -hmm. And uh, and they just thrive like I can keep it like I do a corn snake in some sense besides the heat. Yeah, and that's kind of what I like about them. Yeah, no, that, that water snake is very uh, very pretty snake. Um, you know, there's no pattern or anything like that. But just looking at, it, I don't know if the camera's really catching the iridescence, but and the, how bright yellow the belly is, but it is really great looking snake. And definitely doable size and care. Like I mean, really, so. And you produce those as well? No, no. So for these pythons, these are just pets and we just have lone females. Okay. It's something to where I always get females first so that if I decide, you know, I call these my pets, but maybe one time I decide why do I have an adult female without breeding her? So, mm. you know, I always get a female That's just so I'm ahead of the game. <laughs> That's what Ryan does. He's uh, no sense in having an animal if you're not going to breed it, uh, except for our cats and dogs. So. <laughs> this here. Right? That look cool? Just, just yeah. <laughs> So this here is our Diamond Jungle Carpet Python, and this is actually a mix of two subspecies, which is actually the Jungle Carpet and the Diamond Carpet Python. Ooh, people are going to hate that I called it a Diamond Carpet. It doesn't matter. Nobody watches our videos anyway. Yeah. <laughs> the right people will. Trust me. <laughs> But this, this animal, I mean, you keep it, so diamond pythons are known for being the more southern uh, python in Australia, which means that in Australia, obviously, it's flipped, so they're most cold weathered. Right. And you actually need to drop those down, you know, into the 50s sometimes. It could be some scary, or I guess it could be kind of scary for uh, yeah. python people who aren't used to going Trust down. Me, when me, when we start doing our blue tongues, and you're like, oh, okay, we can get them down to the 30s. What? <laughs> I don't want to do that. Well, well let's do 60. I want 60. Like, I think the first rule of snake keeping is to not let your snakes get cold, right? Yeah. But, uh, yeah, so it is a species that's interesting for a python, but the jungle in it, and jungle is actually the northernmost carpet python, so it's like taking two snakes that would never, ever be together, but it makes a snake that, you know, can be kept like a normal carpet python. Mm -hmm. So. The, the, the diamonds will actually, they need to be cooled or else it seems like their internal clock almost works faster and they'll actually die at a younger age. So, oh, yeah, I so people, people had diamonds dying at six or eight years of age and that's highly unusual for a carpet python, you know, you can mm. go easily 20 plus with an animal like this. And uh, yeah, once they started mixing, and I don't condone mixing jungle with diamond because mm. people really like to keep that clean, but it makes a tractable animal and it's just an animal that I'm not gonna breed, it's just for looks. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a beautiful animal and that's why I like it. For sure, that head is just unbelievable. So Yeah, really he's like uh, he's probably uh, 2013 or so, so he's uh, he's not young, but he's not old and the the head kind of kept that amazing yellow coloration, but he yeah. kind of browned out uh, on the body. No, it's, it's real cool looking. Okay. They're great. 
So Joe, thank you so much for having us over. Um, we love your animals, they're really pretty, and I know that we didn't get to see that many because you had a lot of information. Maybe one day we can come back and you know do a, a, a another tour or something like that when it's uh, you know breeding season or, or when you have babies or something. But So one of the other things that you guys do with all of these animals is that you also have a podcast, right? So tell us a little bit about that, what got you into it, and you know what is your podcast? Yeah, so we first started From the Ground Up podcast, I think it was 2017. And now we're, you know, over a hundred episodes and we have reptile keepers, we have reptile breeders, we have wildlife biologists, and we try to talk about all types of animals. I mean, it really doesn't matter. We had a wolf episode, nice. you know, recently. So it's like, we're just trying to get reptile information out there as much as possible and talk to really cool and interesting people. That's awesome. So, and you said that, you know, when you really are thinking that you're at your high point, you want us to talk, you know, just to humble you out, you know, so we'll, we'll do that. We'll like, you know, really bring down the ratings. It'll be great. <laughs> <laughs> no, I really look forward to having you guys on mm -hmm. and we can just talk snakes and yeah, have I'm, fun. I'd love and... to do that. So, so, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll uh, share his link down below so you guys can check that out check out this podcast. And, uh, you know, check out his, you guys have Facebook, you have Instagram, you have YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. I mean, oh, name snap. it, man. All right. So we'll link, we'll link all that down below so you guys can check that out. So also, if you guys see something in the collection that you thought was really cool, or if you thought you uh, had something that you want to add to a morph that he has or some idea AKA for- correct me. Yeah. Is or, that what or, you're saying? No, not correct you. Like if you have ideas, because sometimes people tell us like, you know, oh, it'd be really cool if you bred these two together and maybe it's something that we didn't think about. You know, it's just something where you guys can get involved and, you know, share your knowledge with us. So hopefully you guys like this episode and we really appreciate you guys watching. Make sure you hit that subscribe button and, uh, you know, we'll be seeing you soon. I thought you were so, going to say bell. I was going to make a bell. The bell? We do the bell on mm -hmm. Ryan yells at me. He yells at me because I'm always on like the bell. Because I dance with him. Anyway, he started it. <laughs> So, thank you so much for watching, and we will be seeing you guys next time. If you made it this far, you're on the team. Mm, thank <laughs> you to our outro. sponsor, Hasbro. <laughs> yeah, and this video has been brought to you by Hasbro. Thank you so much for making such great games. Hasbro, give us free stuff. Or I can, I can do an intro. I don't know. What are you? <laughs> Sorry, man. Do you want to do an intro? No. <laughs> I don't care. All right, so I'll do it one more time. I'll say John. This time. Joe. Joe. I don't know why you said John. You told me John. Joe. Ryan, Ben, Joe. We were at John. We got pork. We were at John's with pork. There we yeah. go. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, guys. I'm <laughs> confused with the pork place. Hey, man, this is really good pork. It's really good. <laughs> I mean, as long as it's good. <laughs> All right. Is this going to be B-roll? Is not even going to be my voice? Uh, we, it is now. Ah, oh, well. <laughs> it's not a blooper reel. <laughs> so, <laughs> they yeah, actually, they actually cool do stuff. have, yeah, they actually do have two morphs. So there's actually an airy okay. and there's a... Albino? I'm just going to be a guess, man. Yeah, <laughs> What's the, uh, okay. Melanistic? So, <laughs> yeah. So, so these guys actually have two morphs. One of them is an anery, and the other one is silverleaf, which silverleaf is like a pattern mutation. Well, no, I mean, there's no other <laughs> silverleaf, so you, yeah. there's no way you would know, but yeah, so they have it. He's super calm. <laughs> really good. Once I talk, there you go. I was about to say, once I talk, you're gonna strike me. All right, let me get them now. <laughs> so is that a bull snake? Um, this is a Louisiana pine snake. Pine? <laughs> wow. If you want to get defense, if you want to get like footage of her. So you pooped on me and you bit me. Well, that's the only one that, that eats really well, so I guess oh, that makes cool. sense. I can give you one that's not like that. No, it's fine. Too late now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I told you you'd get bit, bit or first. peed on or pooped on. and It was all three at once. Nice. nice. Jinx? Just a thing. Okay. He's about to do it. You see him? He thought about it. He opened his mouth for one second. Nah. This looks kind of like food. I don't know. Oh, there you go. No. So okay. the color of a dead pinky. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'm the complexion of a dead pinky. That's what I'm going for. <laughs>